when we first started the Harvest Festivals, uh, Living Local, we talked a lot about why Living Local is important. Uh, now we're focusing on what uh, people can do in a very concrete and specific way in their own personal lives, in their lives, in our community, to ensure that we will increase our self-sufficiency and uh, the sustainability of our life here on the island. And the presentations address stewardship of our environment, local food, hence the apiary, and uh, energy. At the end of this, there'll be a presentation by Mark London on the island plan. And as I said earlier, we're really counting on your participation. Everett knows that he's going to engage you. Uh, we don't have to invite him to do that. Uh, if you have any difficulty hearing, uh, please speak up. Um, and Everett's going to carry a traveling mic. You ready? So, Everett needs some introduction. Uh, he has been beekeeping, as best we can tell, uh, for the better part of his life. Uh, he has arguably the largest commercial apiary in Rhode Island. And he's come here uh, some distance for this short period of time with us, and we're indeed grateful. Thank you very much. Oh, he's, he's being very polite. I've been keeping bees for a really long time, um, probably um, about 35 or 40 years now. Uh, I've lost track because I can't remember when I started. But I was very, very young. Now, I'll tell you more about that, but I'm going to draw a parallel. Now, how many, um, I know there's at least four beekeepers in the, in the audience here. I recognize four people, five. Oh, boy, look at that. This is six or seven or eight or nine. Um, and so the rest of you are, um, are, who, are, the rest of you, are you interested in becoming beekeepers? Any hands? Oh, great. So that is, so is there anybody who isn't either a beekeeper or going to become a beekeeper? Now I know who I have to work on. Well, that's not fair. You're with Lindsay. So <laughs> and, and I take it that, that, um, that Lindsay's daughter your, is your beautiful granddaughter? Or, or, no? Not really? Okay. Well, I tell you, beekeeping is so easy. I went out to Lindsay's house um, over the uh, summertime, and her daughter, four, three, three, three and a half, um, had her bee veil on, and she, she, um, she was so short, as, as any three and a half year old would be, and she was looking right into the beehive. Her, her nose couldn't have been any more than four or five inches from that beehive. And um, we have a technique called powdered sugar dusting. We use that to control the mites. And uh, her daughter was, uh, was an expert at it before the afternoon was over. So if, if she can do it, the rest of you can do it. Just don't, don't be afraid. Okay, well, I've been, I've, um, I own and operate Behave in Apiary. That name uh, came to me, care of my sister. I was maybe um, 11 or 12 or 13 years old, something like that, I don't remember. And we lived on a, a farm in Rhode Island. There's still a few of them left there. And we, that's where I grew up. And I was out taking care of the bees. Now, my father was a biologist for the state of Rhode Island, so he um, always encouraged us to do something with wildlife. He wasn't um, all that thrilled about the bees, but he was okay with, um, with the idea that I was doing this. And my mother really took a liking to her. She actually became the second beekeeper in the family. So in any event, you know, I'm out there um, working with the bees down on the lower lawn, and my sister Sandy, who always had uh, some rivalry with me, she's the closest to me. I come from a family of, um, of eight, so she, she was uh, just a little bit older than me, so I always had this rivalry going. And Sandy was just sitting there at the kitchen table, all frustrated that I was out there working those bees, and she said to my other sister Jean, she said, I don't know what he sees in those bees. And my sister Jean says, who cares, as long as he's behaving. So, behave in apiary it became. <laughs> oh, that was bad, I know. Okay. <laughs> that was back in the days when it was good. Now, a lot of people ask me how I got started. Well, it, it's, um, it, it's another family thing. My dad and I were out walking in the woods, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's a honeybee and what isn't a honeybee. But uh, we were out walking in the woods, and one of us stepped on a yellow jacket nest. And we've had this ongoing argument for 30-odd years who it was that actually stepped on that yellow jacket nest. Was it him? Which I think it was. Or was it me? Which he thinks it was. And so we argued and argued. Well, Dad finally passed away a few years ago, so I win. It was him. <laughs> <laughs> and so we stepped on that nest and, and um, got stung up pretty badly by the time we got down from the barn to the house. It was, uh, it was pretty bad. And at that point, I was terrified. Most of us had been stung 
uh, by a wasp or a hornet or a bee when we're little. And when that happens, it leaves this indelible memory. It scares us to death about the bees. And that's usually what does it. And so you, you have this uh, interpretation, um, taking a look at becoming a beekeeper. That's the number one barrier. Do I, you know, can I get stung and, and be okay with that? So we'll talk a little bit about that too. But I was terrified and, and very young at the time. And so it was an indelible memory. And I remember that um, a friend of mine um, had a father who was a beekeeper. And, and so when you're working, living in farm country like that, the nearest neighbors can be several miles away. Well, the, this neighbor was about a mile and a half away, and they were the first people that you saw when you went down the driveway and across the path, and so you learned to get along. Because if you didn't, the next friends that you could play with were another mile away. <laughs> so it was either walk two miles or get along with the ones that were the closest. And it turned out they were just a wonderful family and easy to get along with. They had eight boys, and I would go there as, as much as I could, other than farm chores. When we were allowed to go, we, we went. And I remember sitting on the fence and watching Mr. LaFerrier take care of those bees all summer long. And I, I didn't understand it. He was in his shorts and short sleeve. They didn't wear a veil. And he would just be in those hives. He had 15 of them. And he'd be in those hives every, every Saturday, like clockwork. He was a very habitual man. Um, and so he'd be there every Saturday at 10 o'clock. And um, right about August sometime, uh, he came up the hill. And, and he looked at me. And he's French Canadian. And he looked at me and said, you're going to stand there and help me take care of the bee. And so that began my career, taking care of the bee. We're all macho boys, you know, and so if he could do it in his shorts, I wasn't going to say anything. I was terrified, but I wasn't going to say anything. So I, I began, uh, began taking bees. So he was my mentor, and he got me started. Um, an apiary. An apiary is a place where honeybees are kept. A bee farm, basically. It's a bee farm. Um, it, it's interesting, around this area, um, when I say this area, I'll try to remember Martha's Vineyard. It's a little bit different, but forgive me, because I'll blend it in with... Um, you know, with, with Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts and so forth. Um, bee forage is not that great. And so we have a problem with keeping large apiaries. We have no problem keeping small apiaries. An apiary of four or five colonies is uh, very normal in New England. But an apiary of 50, 60, or 100 colonies would be almost unheard of. They would starve to death. And so that's not uncommon, though, when you go out into the Dakotas and the grasslands. Those apiaries can be two and 300 colonies and do just fine all in one area. So everything's relative. You know, we, we adapt things to our circumstances. So an apiary here is four, five, eight, or 10 colonies. And, and 10 colonies would be pushing the limit of the available forage or the available food available to those bees in their two and a half, three mile flight range. So we have to be careful not to overpopulate an area. So I have, because of that, I have bees uh, located all over the place. They are from Connecticut, in Massachusetts, and in southeastern Massachusetts. Uh, that's, that's how I uh, keep them spread out. And they're on farms, uh, wooded lots, people's properties, um, businesses that have, um, uh, you know, like timber operations and things like that. Um, cranberry bogs are, 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 are big. A lot of cranberry growers allow me to keep bees on their property year round. Um, I'm a sideliner. Uh, that means that I do something else uh, as well. Uh, most farmers um, in Rhode Island are small farms, and we all do something else. It's just part of the, uh, part of the deal. So I earn an income um, as a uh, lumber salesperson, and when I'm not selling lumber, I'm, I'm taking care of the bees. I have about uh, 300 colonies at present. Um, I peak out to about 600 during the uh, uh, April, May, and June when I'm pollinating, and then I, I try to uh, reduce it down to about 150 going into the winter. So I'm still in that process of bringing the apiary size down. Um, and then next spring, uh, when they all start to wake up in March, I just bring the size back up again, and the whole thing starts all over again. So it's a continuing cycle. Uh, it's not anywhere near as difficult for a backyard beekeeper. A backyard beekeeper would have two or three hives, and they would do just fine. You would keep them just like that all throughout the year. So don't let me scare you away just because I, I make it hard. Okay. Um, here are the products. Uh, this is not so unusual for a beekeeper. I sell honey. Um, I generate about, or the bees generate about, uh, 30,000 pounds a year. That's 15 tons. That's just enough to, uh, to drown in because it's not thick enough to walk on. So you have to be very careful how you store it. Um, so we, we have honey that we sell. Most of that goes off to um, a packing plant in New Hampshire. Uh, they, they buy it from me in bulk, uh, either in the drum or in totes. Totes are becoming very popular. Tote holds about three and a half thousand pounds or so. So we fill a tote 
you know, we put it on the back of a tractor trailer truck with a uh, forklift and off it goes and, and they bottle it. I don't know what labels go onto it at that point. It just goes somewhere. Um, a lot of it I sell to farm stands in the area. Um, because I'm a commercial beekeeper, I try to limit my sales to wholesale only so that the backyard beekeepers can have a crack at the farm stands. So usually the backyard beekeepers will produce, you know, maybe uh, 40 or 50 or 100 pounds a year. They'll, they'll sell to the farm stands early, uh, sometime you know, around August or September, they'll be selling to the farm stands. They'll run out and then the farm stands start calling me and I, I fill in the gap for them. Or the, the backyard beekeepers will buy it from me and bottle it on, uh, as well. Um, pollination service is, is, um, is really big for me. That's basically where I earn my living. And I'm gonna talk about that fairly extensively, but um, I rent the beehives to farmers. Farmers need um, bees to pollinate their crops so that they produce uh, fruits and berries and seeds and things like that. So they need me so I, I'm able to do that. I rent them, I put them on the back of a truck, go drop them at two in the morning when it's dark out, leave them there for two or three weeks, the crop gets set, go back, pick them up and take them away so that the uh, farm can get on with its normal day-to-day -day operations. Um, I have a bee store in, in um, Smithfield where we sell bee equipment and um, um, we sell bees and uh, beehives in what we call nukes, which um, it's a small baby beehive for all intents and purposes. So that's for people who want to start up beekeeping you need to get the bees from somewhere. You can either try to get a swarm or you can buy the bees ready to go. I sell them like that. There's a lot of folks that, uh, that sell them as well. So that's, that's kind of my life. There's the, um, there's the farm in Smithfield. I like pictures. There's a, there's a typical apiary. This is a really big apiary. Um, I, I, for those of you who don't keep bees who are thinking about it, if you have this big vision of uh, having a lot of hives, don't do this. Uh, <laughs> this, um, this particular apiary is, is just a staging area. This, this, um, this set of colonies are going to go out to uh, cranberry bog. They're going to get put on pallets and staged for cranberry bog. I have to feed them when they're um, in, in a group like this. There's so many bees there that they would starve to death. So I have to put sugar uh, syrup out there for them to, to, uh, to, to eat, otherwise they wouldn't make it. Um, so don't do that because you'll be putting tons and tons of sugar out. But it was a pretty picture. Um, here they are staged um, on pallets. They're, they're, they're ready now. They're getting fed. That's what those jars are. Uh, we're feeding them for the last time uh, before they go on a truck and off they go in and, uh, uh, and groups of six like that. This is um, B-Day um, in Smithfield. B-Day is there's two B-Days, um, usually the uh, first uh, weekend in April and the third weekend in April. It all just depends on the beef uh, producers down in Georgia. But I um, usually get my dates. Um, I know that we're going to be the 9th and uh, what's 14 days? The 21st, the 9th and the 21st or the 23rd. Um, and we buy bees down in Georgia. We bring them up on our trucks and people buy them for me. And this is, this is just a huge deal. We have um, thousands of, um, of packages of bees as we call them. You can see they look like shoe boxes with wire screens and each one of those is a colony of bees with a queen. And people are going to come and pick them up and take them home and put them into their beehives and get going. Um, that's about um, $75, just in case you're wondering how much it costs to buy bees. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful time for, for me and, and the family because we see people we haven't seen in a year, uh, sometimes in two years. You know, uh, most people buy bees once every two or three years. And so we get to see the kids growing up, we get to see the adults growing up. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's really, it's just a great thing. We you know we hear about you know what's happened, who got married, you know who had babies, and and all that stuff. It's just um, it's just a good day, good day for us on the farm. I really like it. Okay, um, what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is identity theft. There is a, there is a such thing with honeybees, so I'll, I'll bet you'll find that interesting. Um, I'm going to make the case for pollination and and why we depend on it because I think it's important that you understand how important that is. And that will give you, I think, the uh, part of the motive to become a beekeeper. We really need you, um, and there's some good reasons why. Um, what's the real problem with honeybees? It's not what you think it is. Um, all that media hype is just what it is. It's media hype, but I, there is a real problem, and that's, that's what we're going to talk about. And then why you should become a backyard beekeeper. So if I do a really good job on pollination and the real problem, you'll, um, you'll become a backyard beekeeper. I should be able to convince you at that point. OK, identity theft. <laughs> There are wasps and there are bees. And this is where everybody gets all mixed up. Um, there are very, very few honeybees, um, unless somebody happens to have a colony nearby. But there are very few honeybees out there. And so uh, there are many, many, many wasps. Wasps are more numerous by far. So what happens is that when you got stung way back when, the culprit was probably a wasp. It was probably not a honeybee. Honeybees are, are um, very gentle. 
They're very work focused, they're very task oriented. If they're out gathering nectar in a flower, then that's what they're gonna do. They're not interested in stinging somebody or chasing you or, or anything like that. Um, you practically have to kill a honeybee to get it to sting you. So that, that's, um, that's what leads me to the conclusion that if you got stung in years gone by, it was probably a wasp. And that's the identity theft. Everybody thinks that this guy is a honeybee. That guy is a wasp. That, that is a yellow jacket, a common yellow jacket. <laughs> yep, yeah, and, and this, um, black and yellow. And, and they're particularly nasty because um, they, they can sting multiple times. A honeybee stings once and then it, um, it dies. Um, a, a, a yellow jacket can sting multiple times. They can also bite pretty fiercely. And so between biting and stinging, um, they're, just, uh, they're just doing us in for reputation. So chances are that, that's what got you. But there are white-faced horns and things like that. That is a honeybee. You see the difference? First of all, it's not yellow, she, she's, uh, she's amber, but look at all that hair on her body. It's all that little fuzz that makes her nature's little dust mop. And it's nature's little dust mop that's so valuable to us. As she goes around looking for nectar, she's uh, just dusting everything. She's dusting all the pollen off of all the flowers and transferring that pollen from flower to flower. And that's what causes pollination to happen. She doesn't even know she's doing it. Um, as she flies through the air um, at, at uh, maybe you know 30 miles an hour or so, she develops a static electricity charge over her body, and those little hairs just tracked pollen to it. They just, all the dust and pollen in the world just jumps right onto the honeybee, and she gets heavy. And because she's heavy, she tries to, um, to, to get rid of it. So she gets it off her body and packs it into her back hind legs. Uh, you can see she's starting to do that in the picture. Those back hind legs have little spots of pollen as she's building up. They'll, um, they'll be pea-sized by the time she gets through packing pollen into her hind legs. And by packing that pollen in there, she's, uh, she's doing two things. She's carrying it from flower to flower, but she's also going to take it back to the hive, and they use that as their source of protein. Bees only need two things to live. They need carbohydrates, which come from the sugars in the sap of the plant, otherwise known as nectar, and they need protein, which comes from the uh, pollen. Those two things sustain their life, and because of that, they're out there gathering it at all times, and that's what makes them such great little pollinators. She's pretty, too, compared to the other one. Now, I keep referring to her, her as she. The, uh, the gals in the audience would be happy to know that of the beehive, 99% of its inhabitants are women. The queen is, uh, there's one queen, one fertile bee, the queen, and she lays all of the uh, eggs that cause the population to grow. And then all of the children um, are uh, girls, except for maybe, I don't know, 500 drones or so. So in a beehive uh, of about 30,000 honeybees, um, there's about 500 drones or male bees. The drones have only one purpose, as you can imagine, and that's to help with the, uh, the, the job of making babies. Now, the drone does that once in his life, and it's over. So the, uh, the young virgin flies out. Uh, she, she's a little promiscuous. She'll mate with 8 to 20 drones. That's the only time that that happens on that one mating flight, 8 to 20. She stores for, the, uh, for, most of, for her life. She stores her... Um, I'm looking for children, so I'm okay here. She stores um, semen for the, for the rest of her life. She brings that back. The eight to 20 drones drop and fall to the ground dead, and uh, she carries on with the hive. She never leaves the hive again unless the colony swarms. Now, the girls, having taken care of everything in that hive, honeybees are extremely clean, and so they scrub that hive clean. They take out the dead, they, uh, they pick up the debris in the bottom board, uh, they, they wax the, uh, the sides of the hive with a pro uh, substance called propolis, which is made from beeswax on their bellies and the sap from the trees. They, they are really super, super clean. And they do all this work. They gather all the food, they cap all the cells. They, you know, the capping of the cells uh, keeps the honey fresh. It's kind of like canning, analogous to canning for, for uh, foods and so forth. They take care of the babies. All this work gets done by the gals. So what happens in the fall? The girls look at the boys and say, you know what, you've been hanging around all summer. <laughs> the couch potatoes, you eat a lot, we don't need you, and they toss them out, and the, uh, the drones uh, are, are found in the grass on a cold uh, September morning, and that's the end of them. So by the time December rolls around, there aren't any boys left in the hive. So I can tell the girls like that already. Now what's a hive? This, um, this is not honeybees, this is a paper wasp. Uh, and it goes for my identity theft, uh, I get a little sidetracked there. But it's my um, identity theft thing, that's a paper wasp. A lot of folks see that hanging in a tree and they say honeybees, uh, and it isn't. Most of my swarm calls are, are this mistaken identity. That, however, is a swarm of honeybees. So you can see why 
folks mistake the two. You know, that, that looks a lot like the paper wasp nest, especially if it's more football shaped or basketball shaped, which they often are. Uh, that's a swarm of honeybees. Um, honeybees reproduce in two ways. They, they make children, and they also divide the colony. So in the spring, if all the conditions are right, um, they'll make a second queen. The, the new queen stays behind. The older queen goes out, and when she does, she takes about two-thirds of the hive with her. They, uh, they find a tree like this, and they gather in that tree, and they start looking for a new home. Um, this is a phenomenal sight. If this happens, and you happen to be in the middle of it, there will be thousands of bees in the air. It'd be like a starry night. It'd be like you're standing in the universe. It's just amazing uh, to be in the middle of it all. Very, very gentle. You will not get stung. Um, they'll just do all this flying around, and then they finally locate themselves on a branch like that into a cluster, and they begin hunting for a home. Uh, now there are two hives in nature, right? There was one. It divided. Now there are two. So it's a form of propagation. That's how they increase their numbers. Um, it takes about um, a day, day and a half to two days for a, a swarm like this to find another home. So this whole thing will, will happen all over again. They'll, they'll go into the air and they'll fly off somewhere and then they, they uh, set up housekeeping wherever their new home may be. So that's one of the most remarkable things you'll ever see. And um, the other thing that makes honeybee habitat so interesting is that they build their comb. Their comb is uh, natural wax. They build that from uh, glands on their abdomen and the, uh, what they call the turgid plates, and this is how uh, they secrete this. Just like we secrete earwax, they secrete beeswax. And they secrete this and they build their comb. Uh, they have to hang that comb from something. Bees can't build their comb easily from the ground up. They can do it, but it, it's not, not something that they, they like to do. They like to hang that comb. So you provide a flat horizontal surface, the bees will draw a comb downward. And so if you see those structures on the outsides of houses, chances are those aren't honeybees because honeybees need shelter, first of all, and secondly, they need something to draw their comb on. So those are probably the wasps that you see on the outside of the house. But on the inside of the house, they can be massive colonies. Look, look at the uh, wall cut away here next to this youngster in comparison. You can see the, uh, the comb just hanging from the ceiling. So those, those bees moved in and they can do that in about a three month period. They can, they can really take up some space. So if you see them on the outside, they're probably not honeybees. If they're on the inside, they probably are. This um, is not such a great picture, but it's a yellow jacket nest. Yellow jackets nest in the ground. It's one of the first questions I'll ask if somebody calls and asks me to remove a swarm. I'll say to them, where are they? And they'll say, well, they're in the ground, you know, uh, underneath my flagstones or underneath the porch. If that's the case, they're probably yellow jackets. It's a case of mistaken identity, so I'll explain that to them. Uh, yellow jacket nests are very small in the spring, maybe, um, 15, 18 bees. By the time August comes around, there's probably, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 bees. So you could be out mowing the lawn all summer long. And then finally August rolls around, and that's when we hear about people getting stung by yellow jackets because the colonies now are so big that the, uh, the bees become more aggressive. They have more to defend. And so that's when most folks get stung by yellow jackets is towards August and September, very seldom in the spring. That's a mud wasp. You can recognize it by the little tubes that it makes and they usually stick those tubes on the outside of a building. Okay, that picture is to remind me that we're gonna shift gears now and talk a little bit about pollination. The, um, the thing that I, I wanted you to notice about this picture of an orchard, besides how beautiful it is, this, this is one of the nicest things about spring. The orchards start to bloom, and they bloom fairly early, probably um, you know second week of May. Um, and it's just uh, phenomenal to go out to a 50-acre apple orchard and just see that sea of white blossoms, white and pink blossoms, just gorgeous. The, uh, look how dense that is. Lots and lots of flowers. That, that'll be a theme in a minute, but there's probably you know, maybe a million flowers right there. Okay, pollination. That's the process by which pollen is transferred from the plants, thereby enabling fertilization and sexual reproduction. It's how, the, it's how a plant makes babies. Uh, the seeds of the plant and the fruit of the plant are the, are the plant's offsprings. They have a very similar process to us. They, they, two things have to come together, and when they come together, uh, fruit is born and the fruit is the, uh, the baby of the plant. So pollination then, as you can imagine, becomes a very necessary step in the reproduction of flowering plants. They have, they have to reproduce just like everything else. And what we really want is genetic diversity. We always want genetic diversity. The last thing we want is, is hybridization that's so narrow that, that funny things start to happen. And, and maybe that's a different topic and, um, and a different place, but we've heard a lot about genetically modified everything these days. And you have to start wondering about that, you know, whether a little more genetic diversity might be better in our favor. So genetic diversity comes from pollination, and it's the bees 
and the insects and the birds and so forth, transferring pollen from one flower to another, from one parent to another, that causes all that, that diversity to happen. So it's a critical thing that goes on. Um, this is where it happens. You see all the pollen on the stamens? There's one, two, three, four, five, six stamens, maybe seven there? Yeah, seven. Um, they have to transfer it from the stamens to the structure in the middle. When that happens, the pollen sprouts a tube. The tube goes down to the center of, of the, um, or the base of the plant. And when that happens, the fruit begins to form or the seed begins to form, depending on what type of plant it is. And it's just a, a very, very simple process. But the question becomes, how does the pollen get from there to there? You know, something has to help it transfer. It could be the wind. If that, uh, that structure, that carpal structure is lower, just uh, sometimes the, the gravity makes it happen. The plant self-pollinates. If it's the same height like that or a little bit higher, then it needs an insect to pollinate it. Okay, many orchard and vine crops must be pollinated by insects to produce fruit. Um, a cranberry is a great example. Uh, without an insect, there will be no fruit on a cranberry plant at all. And that becomes a, a necessary thing. Apples uh, require cross-pollination to be healthy, so we need uh, insects to, to pollinate apples. Peaches, some varieties need uh, pollination, but most do not. They're self-pollinating. Corn is wind-pollinated. The wind blows and takes care of corn. So not everything has to have an insect, but insects really make a big difference when they're there. Now, the, uh, the overall thing I want to make a point here is we depend on these crops for food. This is how we survive. And we need the fruits and we need the seeds. Now, what does this guy have to do with pollination? That's a Texas Longhorn cattle. He eats. What does he eat? Yeah, grass, alfalfa. Now, if the alfalfa is not being reproduced, there's no seeds. If there's no insects, we've got a big trouble with the bee supply. So you see how interdependent all of this is? Uh, you know, we take it for granted. You know, we hear a lot about um, the issues with the honeybees, and everybody asks me, is it true? Are we really so dependent on the honeybees that we would starve to death? It's probably, it's probably an exaggeration. There's a lot of native pollinators out there. We don't really need the honeybees, but the honeybees make a big difference, and look how far-reaching their impact is, even right down to cattle and dairy products. Okay. Now, um, the thing you should know is that our honeybees are not our honeybees. They were imported from Europe in about the 1650s, so they're, they're not native to the United States. Uh, the bumblebee is, um, and the orchard bee is, but the, uh, the honeybee is not. So when you think about that, something that's been imported, has, has been here for 400 years, is now threatened, and, and we'll talk about why, why she's threatened. Um, do we really need them? Do we really need those honeybees? And the answer is not really. We really don't need them, um, but we do need them, and I'll make that case. There are thousands of species of native pollinators available to us, so superficially, we don't need the honeybees. And in fact, there's a lot of argument by some naturalists that honeybees, because of their big populations, overwhelm an area and drive out the native po pollinators. So there might, be, there might be a case that the honeybees could be harmful. I don't think that's the case, but that's, that's what some will argue. But let's meet some of those native pollinators. Um, wind, rain, and water. A lot of plants um, uh, are aquatic, and the pollen drops into water and transfers some plant to plant right through the water. The wind certainly is a big, big factor in pollination, particularly of the uh, evergreen trees. We see that green pollen jumping into the air in big puffs of, uh, uh, of, of wind you know, during the spring. It gets in our noses and all over everything, and, and you can see that happening. Um, animals, birds, and bats are, are huge pollinators as well. The ants do a good job. The wasps do a good job. Uh, the bees do the best job, not necessarily the honeybees, but the bees in general as a family do the, uh, the best job, and moths do a pretty good job of pollinating as well. There's a honeybee. We saw that picture earlier. There's a, um, uh, a carpenter bee. A carpenter bee gets uh, another case of mistaken identity. A lot of people think the carpenter bee is a bumblebee, but it, but it isn't. And you can always tell a carpenter bee because her butt's on the shiny side. So if you see a bee flying around with a shiny butt, uh, that's not a bumblebee, it's a carpenter bee. Start looking in the wood structures around your house and look for those holes that they bore. Uh, a lot of times they call carpenter bees borer bees because they bore holes in, the, in your porch and then it collapses. Uh, that is a bumblebee. See all the hair? So that makes that's the difference between the carpenter bee and the bumblebee is all that hair. Yeah, the bumblebees here tend to be on the green side too. They have green stripes. That's a hummingbird. That's not a hummingbird. That's one big moth. That's the uh, sphinx moth, and she, uh, she is native to the area. 
And some folks will see that moth flying around and think that that's a hummingbird. It has the same pattern, darting in and out. And, um, but she's, uh, technically she's a moth. Uh, that is a squash bee. If you are growing squash and you lift up your squash flowers in the morning and two, three, or four bees fly out, it's probably a squash bee. Squash bees are native and do a really good job with squash and vine crops. That's a, um, an orchard bee. We see those bees in the uh, um, orchards, apple orchards and peach orchards and so forth. Okay. So then why all the fuss? If native pollinators can do the job, then why all the fuss about the honeybees? Why do we need them? Um, well, the, the reason is because the way we grow things, it's, it's really more of a farming issue than it is a nature issue. Left to nature, uh, we would have um, inside of an acre, I don't know, I don't even know how to, how to estimate this number, we'd have very few cranberry points. Cranberries is one of our native berries uh, to New England. And left to nature, a cranberry plant would grow nicely. It can grow in the soils, but it wouldn't be anywhere near like a cranberry bog. It would just be there. And that low density of natural growth would be easily handled by the uh, native pollinators. It was a system. It was meant to be. Um, you know, a few thousand cranberry blossoms and a few thousand pollinators were good. Not a big deal. But man comes along and we have to feed big populations. So what do we do? We put a million cranberry plants in an acre. You know, those probably numbers don't have anything to do with reality, but it's the idea that I'm painting, the picture that I'm painting. When you look at a cranberry bog, that's a very dense area of blossom that would never occur in nature. And so now we have the need to bring in even more pollinators to do the job. Apple orchard is a great example. If you have a 50-acre apple orchard, the grower is going to do his or her best to eliminate all of the weeds in the orchard. So they're going to use Roundup, they're going to use uh, you know, uh, tilling, tillage and things like that. They're going to get those weeds out of there. Well, 50 acres of wasteland at that point can't support native pollinators. Where are they going to eat? Once the bloom is gone, it's another five or six months of nothing. So their habitat gets destroyed and their food source gets eliminated. So the native pollinators cannot do a good job on a 50-acre apple orchard. And again, those orchards have millions of blooms besides, so we have to bring bees in to, to offset it. And, and so it goes for all of the crops. Oh, there's, in fact, I should have shown the picture. There's a cranberry bog. Look at the density of that bloom. Those are the berries themselves. That's not the bloom. The cranberry bloom is white. But every one of those berries was a blossom. And look how dense that is. You know, nature never intended that. So to pollinate that, we have to bring the bees in, or we have to bring some level of insect in. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so now we have this idea of migratory beekeeping. Migratory beekeeping, that's, that's a little bit of who I am. Um, migratory beekeepers take their bees, put them on trucks, and take them somewhere. Um, they, they do this um, uh, by the tens of thousands. In Massachusetts, in the, uh, you know, the Cape area where, where just as you get off the, the uh, ferry, uh, there's a lot of cranberry box. And that time of the year, around June and the 10th, those bogs begin to bloom. And when they do, beekeepers from all over the country start shipping beehives in. They come in in the night. Um, I, I heard somewhere that's an upwards of 40,000 colonies, 40,000 colonies of bees come in in a five or six day period. Um, land on the ground at the corner of 495 and 28. There's a big field there, big staging area. They get on the ground that the uh, state comes and they inspect them to make sure there's no disease and things like that. And then they get distributed off to the cranberry bogs. The, uh, the almond crop in California in February, um, if they had their way, would take every single colony in the United States. It's an unending demand for bees in California. Uh, they, they, uh, it's just everybody that does anything by way of commercial beekeeping and pollination ends up in the, in the almond blossom in February. That's just a huge, huge demand on our resources. Um, and then there's everything in between. The apple orchards uh, in Massachusetts uh, uh, place huge demands on as well. No, I don't go anywhere near California, but I'll do blueberries um, in Maine and, and New Hampshire. I'll do apples uh, up, up in the uh, Holliston area uh, and, and um, cranberry bogs uh, in Freetown and New Bedford and, uh, you know, up around that area. I'm not, I'm not big enough to go to California, although they gladly take them. Uh, there's just such a huge shortage. Um, honeybees are the ideal insect pollinator for this purpose because of their large numbers. Remember, yellow jackets will pollinate, but they have small colonies. A colony of a thousand yellow jackets isn't going to handle a million blossoms. The um, bumblebees are, are probably the best pollinator. They're up early in the morning, they, they go to bed late at night, and they work in the rain. Uh, bumblebees just work and work and work. Honeybees are a little bit lazy that way. They get up late, the sky's got to be blue, the temperature's got to be right. 
but they've got 30,000 bees in a colony. So when the time comes, if the, everything's just perfect, when the time comes, those bees get out there and they do a really good job. A, a colony of honeybees can pollinate an acre of, of crop in a three-day period. Um, a colony of, of bumblebees will never pollinate an acre of crop. They just can't do it. There's not enough of them. But a colony of honeybees can. So all we have to do is have good weather, and everything is fine. There's a tractor trailer load of honeybees going somewhere. It's a, there's another implementation. I used to do these trailers and take them out and just park them. Um, I, I, I did that when I was much smaller. Uh, now, now we put them on pallets and just take them out in, onto the orchard and just drop them like that. Okay, how many, well, as a, as a production beekeeper, I try to build those colonies up to 30,000 bees in the room first. Now, here in New England, we have two flows, two nectar flows. Um, a lot of places in the country don't, so that's the one of the, of the good things about this area. We have two flows, one in June and one in September-ish. You know, it depends on your, on your uh, area, but it's going to be like that, June and September for, for you know, all intents and purposes. Um, in June, it's about four weeks. It's over on the 4th of July. We go dry. Even though things are blooming, they may not necessarily produce nectar. So we go dry July and August. You might see a lot of goldenrod out there in August, but it's not doing anything other than blooming, as far as the bees are concerned. Uh, then in September, right about the uh, first week of September, the 5th, the 10th, the 8th, right in there, um, it starts up again, and we get an aster flow, and the right strains of goldenrod are blooming, and then we get a nice goldenrod flow as well. Um, the bees have, if you think about it, maybe seven weeks out of the entire 52 to gather all of their supplies for one year. That's why they're so job-focused. As soon as something blooms, they're on it. Uh, they have to be because that's their window of opportunity. They have a seven-week window of opportunity to gather for them 60 to 80 pounds of nectar of honey, cured honey, in the hive by the um, end of October in order to survive the winter, 60 to 80 pounds. So they have to gather that. Anything above that, I can take. So uh, in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the average is about 40 pounds additional. And 40 pounds of surplus is what we can take. Sometimes they do really well and there's 120 pounds. Sometimes they do really poorly and we're feeding them sugar syrup. It just um, averages are averages. But that's how it works. So about um, seven weeks to gather all their food. If, if the key though is I going to get 30,000 bees in that hive. I have to build them up and make sure that they're ready. If I can get the population higher, say up to 45 or 60,000 bees, which you can do, it, it takes a lot, but you can do it, um, they'll make honey out of pond water. But 30,000 bees will make honey. Anything less than that, you won't get a surplus. There's just not enough bees to do the job. Um, we need at least two beehives per acre on average. That's what the USDA is recommending. Uh, we're finding through some studies that are being done that it's actually more today, probably because colony strength is much lower than it used to be. Back when they made that two colony per acre estimate, um, beekeeping was much, much different. Those numbers come from the 1940s, and they've never changed them. Today, the bee is, is weakened, and she's not as able to, do, to work as hard as she used to be able. The colony strengths are very low. Uh, we have a real problem there. Um, so we probably need a lot more than two colonies per acre. A 50-acre apple orchard can have about 3 million bees in the air at any given moment. 3 million bees in the air. Can you imagine? And when you walk, walk in that orchard at 10 o'clock in the morning, the grower is very quick to point out that your bees are sound asleep. So right about 11 o'clock, they wake up and they get into the flowers. And there's a method that we use. We take a, um, a square made out of wood, you know, fairing strip, if you, if you can imagine, or a picture frame, one meter, in size, we hang that on a branch, get out the old stopwatch, and we've got to see three bees cross that meter in three minutes. Three bees in three minutes in a meter, and there's three million of them out there. That gives you an idea of the task at hand. You would think that you would have dozens of bees flying through with three million in the air, but they're all working those blossoms, and there are millions of blossoms. So it gives you an idea how much bees that you really need to do in orchard. Um, bumblebees, again, they're excellent pollinators, but there's only 150 to 180 per colony. Yellow jackets, 15 to 3,000. And when's the last time you thought thousands of hummingbirds? As good as they are, there's just not too many of them. Okay, so what's the threat that I've been alluding to? There's this whole idea. Go ahead, get a question. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. 
Uh, the, the, she, she wanted to know uh, who, 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 who gathers the most honey, who produces the honey, and who produces the wax. Um, the wasps produce very little wax and honey, uh, so they're out. You know, they, they, uh, they just make just a tiny little bit. Um, of the bees, like the bumblebees, the bumblebees produce honey, but they produce them in little pots that they make, almost like clay pots, literally from sand and water and things like that. They make little clay pots in the ground, and they'll store maybe five or six ounces of honey in a big colony. Uh, yellow jackets will store a little bit of nectar, again, maybe ounces like that. The honeybees are the only ones that will store pounds of honey uh, and lots of pounds of honey. So honeybees are the uh, prolific producers of honey. Honey, by the way, is, is nothing more than um, cured nectar. It's uh, the nectar from the, um, uh, the plant is a sap. It's wet and then watery. It's got a little bit of sugar in it. That's what attracts the bee. She brings it back. Um, she adds enzymes by transferring it from her mouth to another bee, to another bee, and then finally into a cell where it's stored. In that process of, of injecting those enzymes, saliva, from her mouth, in that process, she breaks that uh, sugar down from complex sugars into the simple sugars, fructose uh, being the predominant uh, component of honey, and the evaporation of water begins, and it's much like maple syrup. You evaporate enough water, it becomes thick, and it becomes honey. And so. You can imagine how many droplets of water end up in a hive to produce 80 pounds of honey. Um, I don't know, millions, but um, it's, it's an amazing process, just like maple syrup. You gotta have a lot of it to get very little in the end. Um, okay, so we've been hearing a lot about CCD. CCD is colony collapse disorder. It's the disappearing bees. What happens is that you go out into the apiary, there was a nice colony of bees, the next day, they're gone. Now, the key is that they, to, to be colony collapse disorder, they have to have left behind a queen, a little bit of brood, and a handful of bees. If that's not the case, then it's something else happens. So uh, there, are, there are a couple of situations where bees will just leave the hive, and a lot of beekeepers get confused by that, and they'll think that they see colony collapse disorder, but the reality was it was something else, like the bees absconding or, or pesticides racked through the hive, or the bees just took off, they swarm. Uh, something like that. So colony collapse disorder, the, the characteristic is that it moves through the apiary. If you have 20 highs in a row, it starts at one end and sweeps through the apiary, and the bees are gone except a handful, a queen, and a little bit of brood. That's, that's how you recognize colony collapse disorder. And it's literally overnight, within hours, that type of thing. You could be there in the morning, they could be gone in the afternoon. Um, it has never been documented that I know of in Rhode Island although there have been some claims by beekeepers that um, we've, they've been subjected to it, we haven't been able to document it. I'm not sure about Massachusetts. I, I would say, uh, if not zero, then very little. It uh, hasn't been a phenomenon of concern in Massachusetts. It hasn't been a phenomenon of concern at all in the Northeast, um, and, um, and maybe a little bit through the, north, the great, mid, uh, great North and so forth. So colony collapse disorder got a lot of media attention. It is devastating to those beekeepers who have tens of thousands of hives, the, the big commercial beekeepers who have 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 hives, that, that is devastating to them. The backyard beekeeper may lose a couple hives and may not even know that that colony collapse disorder, disorder has affected them. So that may be why we're not seeing it reported um, around here. We're certainly not hearing, the, the, we're not getting the media attention here that the rest of the, of the country is getting. So, so far, not a problem. So far, not a problem. Um, what is a problem though? Well, for all of the attention that we get on colony collapse disorder and all of the um, uh, awareness in the public, we um, have this little thing called a mite. Now, the mite came in in the middle of the 80s, 1980s. Prior to 1980, beekeeping was very straightforward. You bought bees, you put them in a hive, you stuck them on a flower source, and they did well. Everybody could keep bees. The biggest problem that we had back then was you didn't get enough space by adding boxes to your hive to give them space so they could grow. And they just, you know, they, they, they outgrew the hive and they left. You know, they, they'd leave, um, you know, a third of the bees behind, they'd swarm and two thirds would go away and, you know, the hive would be smaller and weaker and just would just continue on. It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal, you just didn't make any honey that year. But uh, that was it. it. It was very, very hard to mess up. And if the bees died over the winter, it was because we didn't leave them enough honey or they didn't gather enough honey usually. Um, that, that was our biggest challenge. Make sure there was 60 pounds or 80 pounds of honey on there and they did fine for the winter. Um, today, in the 1980s, this, this mite from Asia, we don't know how it came here, but it came here, this mite rolled through the country and when it rolled through the country, it laid waste to every beehive it ran across. Every colony collapsed and we had no idea what was doing it. 
And we just, uh, like a moth to the fire, we started those apiaries up again the following year, only to be wiped out again, and start them up and get wiped out again. By the time, time I got wiped out three times, I quit. I just couldn't afford the reinvestment. We didn't even get the Providence Journal reporting this, you know, let alone uh, MSNBC, or, or I don't think MSNBC was born back then. Um, in the 1980s, the internet was just, uh, just coming out, so we didn't have the media attention that, uh, that we're getting today in colony collapse disorder. It's a shame, really, because the mite was a huge and is a huge problem. We have learned to live with this mite. We have to manage this mite. And this mite has not gone away, and this mite is our problem. Of that, there's no doubt. Every beehive has mites everywhere, in, right through the world. It's a global problem. Um, we were lucky um, three years ago, we were saying that Hawaii and parts of New Zealand were mite free, and it's no longer the case. Uh, the mites are in Hawaii and in New Zealand as well. This is a big, big problem. Look how tiny that mite is. Looks like a little crab. That's on my finger. There's two of them on my finger. There they are on the bee. If you open a colony of bees and you see those mites, that colony is going to die. Um, that, you, you will not save that colony. It's, that's way too many mites. Um, maybe 25 mites in 100 would, would be alarming. You know, 15 would make me upset. You know, eight, you know, we, we, we can handle eight. You know, two or three we're living with. Eight's a problem. You know, 15, I'm starting to get alarmed. 25, when you start seeing bees like this with two mites on them, they are doomed. You know, they did, this is a miracle that this, uh, this bee is still alive. What does this mite do? She's just, uh, so she's a leech. She's like a tick. She gets on that bee and she's sucking the hemolymph which is the bee's blood system. They don't have blood like we do, they have a form of a blood system. And so the mite draws on her hemolymph. Now, if you had your body covered with ticks, you can imagine your blood system would be so weakened and so invaded that even the common cold would become a problem for you. And thus it is with the honeybees. These mites um, drain the life energy out of a colony. And the poor bee can't gather well, she can't reproduce well. Uh, she can't do anything well. She, it looks great. You'll see them flying in and out. You'll think everything's fine. But the reality of it is the colony is slowly but surely perishing. The mite population reproduces in the brood. So the more babies the colony makes, the more mites they make. You know, a lot of beekeepers think they have good strong queens that are in good shape. It's just the opposite. A good strong queen lays a lot of babies. It's a mite factory. So we have to do something about the mites. There's just, there's just no choice about it. If we don't manage the mites, the mites will manage us. Um, so what the mite has done is it has wiped out all of the feral colonies that used to be in our woodland. There are no honeybees in the woodland. If you see a colony of honeybees in the woodland, they won't be there next year. Just tie a yellow ribbon around that tree, go back and check it. The following year, it will be gone because the mites will take them right out. So the only honeybees that we have left are bees and our beehives. That's the thing you're hearing when they say the, the honeybee is endangered. Uh, that, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the case that's being made. Uh, they're not going to be endangered as long as we're taking care of them. The minute we stop taking care of them, they're doomed. Uh, Mother Nature just does not want the bees at this moment in time. It's just the way the, that balance of nature is going. Um, sooner or later, it will reverse itself, but at the moment, that's the way it is. There isn't, there hasn't been a balance yet, not in the last 20 years. Um, we're hoping for it. There's a lot of work being done by way of genetic solutions and breeding and, and things like this. Uh, but so far, no. Uh, no the, the, mite, the mite reproduces a lot faster than the bee does and um, is overwhelming. There are stories, we hear them, you know, so-and-so's kept the hive for five years, um, but so-and-so's hive for five years hasn't done anything for the tens of thousands of hives or the millions of hives that we need to pollinate our crops. So yeah, it's, um, it's a tough problem. The, uh, the challenge here is how do you get rid of a little insect and not the big insect? That really becomes the challenge. Uh, if you have mites on a horse, at least you have a mammal and an insect. A little bit more manageable. Here we have an insect and an insect. So our tool chest is very, very limited of the things that we can do. Um, there are pesticides that we can use, um, but if you put a pesticide into a beehive, what are you doing? Right? You're, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's, it's, you know, it's one problem leads to another problem. So there has to be ways of managing this. Um, backyard beekeepers are, um, are at a real advantage because your ability to manage the mite 
is much better than my ability. I, in, in the springtime, when I have 600 colonies, it's all I can do to get that equipment full of bees onto trucks, out into apple orchards, out into blueberry crops, out into the bogs, back again, and so forth. I don't have time, uh, literally, to manage mites. I need to, because they're going to kill my bees, but I don't have that type of time. So I have to use uh, methods of mite control that would make the backyard beekeeper cringe. You know, everything I can do that's strong, I do because I have to be fast and efficient, except pesticides. I will not use pesticides of any shape, form, or fashion. But right up to that point, so I'll use the organic acids, I'll use the thymols and things like that. I'll do that, but I'll never put the, uh, the pesticides in. The backyard beekeeper is much more fortunate. You have three, five colonies, maybe 10 if you're, if you're really going into it in a big way. So your advantage is you can use uh, uh, more natural practices. You have a screen bottom board. For, so the bottom of the hive used to be wood, now it's screen today, it's something we've learned to do. Why? Because these mites fall off the backs of these bees. And when they fall off, they fall through the screen. That tiny little mite falling to the ground, is, you might as well have to walk to the moon to get back in that hive. So she perishes on the grass. So that's, that's a good thing. So screen bottom boards are, are an absolute must for, for backyard beekeepers. Um, we can exacerbate that situation a little bit. Um, it's really quite ingenious, and this is what Lindsay's daughter did. Um, we take powdered sugar, and we sift it through a flour sifter on the top of the, of the hive. It falls down through the hive, and as it falls down through the hive, it coats the bees with powdered sugar. The bees become little white ghosts, and you can actually see them flying in the air all coated with powdered sugar. Very, very simple to do. Um, the minute that happens, their first reaction is, who threw this stuff at me? The second reaction, hey, this tastes pretty good. <laughs> bees like sweet things. And so by powder sugar dusting the bees, they start to clean each other. And as they clean each other, trying to get that sugar, they knock the mites off. The mites fall down to the bottom of the hive. The, the foot of the mite is so small that that powdered sugar molecule is much bigger, and she can't hold on to the powdered sugar. So we've done two things. We've got the bees to clean themselves, and we've created this slippery slope that the mite can't hold on to. 30% of the mites will drop every time you do this. So if we powder sugar dust every three weeks, we can keep the level of mite very, very low, and that's the point you were making. The colony can now coexist with the mites. It's not an ideal world. We would rather have zero mites. 30% might fall every three weeks. We'll let them live. It won't be like it was in the old days, but they do survive. If it climbs higher than that for some reason, there's other methods we can do. It's very interesting that the mite would rather reproduce herself in the cell of the drone or the male bee. So we can fool the queen into thinking she needs to have more male bees. We put a frame inside the hive with a foundation of wax that has a stamp on it and the stampings of the center of the comb. And if that stamp cell is much larger than a normal worker cell, worker bees are relatively small, the boys are relatively big, so if we put a, a sheet of beeswax in there with big cells, the queen comes along and says, ah, this is a cell for a boy. And she lays an unfertilized egg in that cell. If you put a whole frame of 15 or 1800 cells in there, she will lay 15 or 1800 boys or drones. That's a lot more than you, that you would normally see in a hive. The mite says, oh great, smorgasbord. And she migrates to the drone frame and lays her eggs in with the drones. She ignores the worker frame, so she, uh, she likes this too. So they, this becomes a, a great nursery for mites. Now, what we do is we wait until the egg hatches, it turns into larvae, then the larvae pupates, just like a moth. When that happens, the honeybees seal the cell and they wait for the drone to go through the pupation stage, so until it becomes, emerges. We come along, we know that takes 21 days. So we come along on the 21st day, we take that frame out, it hasn't emerged yet, none of the, none of the boys are born, put it in the freezer, and we just killed a million mites. We killed 3,000 drone bees, but who needs them? Right? The other thing we can do is feed that to the chickens, so we don't have to freeze it at all. The chickens love drone larvae, so it makes a good, uh, good meal for the chickens. Yes? The mites, what are the animals are the mites on? I don't know that they're on animals. I, I understand that they come in with the birds. So they might be on the birds. I don't know if they're coming in with animals. Yeah, it's a different mite, it's a, uh, a different mite that's on the swine and on the um, chickens. It's not, it's not this uh, varroa mite. Yeah, you're fine. Yes.
Thank you. Yeah, that she, she's asking, she, she's, um, she's, she's saying that, that sugar is not generally good for, I'm, I'm modifying a little bit, she's saying sugar is not generally good for humans. It's actually not bad for humans, it's just in excess is not good for us. Uh, so sugar is not good for humans, so is it good for the bees? The answer is yes, because the bees aren't mammals. The, the bees don't eat any, any meats or anything like that. We need amino acids among other things, so our, our dietary needs are much, much different. But the bees, that's the only thing that they can survive on. Well, feeding them carbohydrates. So sucrose, um, and, and give, give the poor sugar farmer a break. You know, he's making a good product too. <laughs> so a cane farmer is a farmer just like, like the rest of us, and they're producing a product called um, uh, white, white granulated sugar. White granulated sugar is, is almost, sucro, almost pure sucrose. Anything pure is good for the insect. Yeah, definitely. Well, I don't, I don't know what processed sugar is. All I know is whatever gets it white makes it pure. So that's the sugar I want. Brown sugar is not good for the bees because it has other things in it that, that are not good for, for, the, for the honeybee. It might be good for other things. But white table sugar, as white as you can get it, is very, very good for the bees. That, that's almost pure sucrose. And that's what they need. That's, that's their dietary. That's probably better for them. Um, God forbid we're typing this, but that's probably, <laughs> it's probably better for them than natural nectars, only because it's likely not to have any pesticides in it from people you know, wantonly spraying pesticides. So I can actually control the health of the hive better by feeding um, white, white granulated sugar. Um, beet sugar is a good substitute as well. Anything that has uh, sucrose, pure sucrose. And the key is I'm, I'm, I'm really focusing on that pure. The, the purer it is, the better off we are because we can control it. Yeah. There's, um, it, in America, we wanted bigger bees. So in the 1940s, we, we, uh, we came out with a cell size, a foundation that, that was bigger. And lo and behold, the, the worker bees were bigger. The bigger worker bee could fly further. She could bring back more nectar. She was a better pollinator. She was a better honey gatherer. You know, bigger and better was, was the theme in the 40s. The natural size of the cell is uh, 4.9 millimeters. So the thought process was if we go back to the natural size of the honey bee, will that allow the honeybee to coexist with the mite? And on paper, it looks great. The math model is, 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 is wonderful. I even tried this myself because I, I thought it was so good on paper. The, uh, the, the one flaw in the logic is if bees build natural comb at 4.9 millimeters, then why don't we have bees in the wild? They would be surviving on their own, wouldn't they? So there's something wrong with the practice of it. Not necessarily the math model, but the practice doesn't bear out. So there hasn't been any successful um, uh, uh, big implementations of small cell yet, but it's one of the hopefuls. You know, we're hoping that uh, something like that will work. Everett, I'm going to have to stop us, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I deliberately did not do as much Q&A, uh, set aside a Q&A session. This has been so fascinating that I didn't want to cut you off, and I hate to do it now, but it's the, only, the next group has 15 minutes, and we're right there. So I'm going to encourage all of you who have questions, and no doubt you do, to just go out on the front porch. And uh, I, Everett is so engaging. We've got to be very grateful for the effort you made to come here. Thank you very much.